No, can't hear you, Kenny. Nope. This is unbelievable. We're just going to take over the podcast. All right, <laughs> Welcome, everybody. This is the Bourbon Roundtable. And tonight we're coming to you live from Kenny's uh, living room where he can't get audio to work. Let's send it around. <laughs> Blake, why don't you start? Who's got the banjo for the... Uh, oh, that's the... right. We need the music. For the past few episodes, I've opened the show talking about it, but now it's time to make it happen. You need to visit kybourbonaffair.com and buy your tickets. It's considered the ultimate bourbon fantasy camp, where you get to go behind the scenes and be a part of the inside crowd rubbing shoulders with master distillers and notable figures in the bourbon industry. One of the highlights every year is being part of a private barrel selection from Knob Creek, Russell's Reserve, and even Four Roses. Evenings are spent having dinner with the Samuels, the brown flame of Old Forester, and the rare chance to taste, to, to taste Fred No's infamous bourbon-inspired barbecue. There's even a murder mystery that will take place at the Evan Williams Experience by Heaven Hill. There's over 40 different events to choose from, including Whiskey Live. But remember, once the tickets are sold out, they are gone. The Kentucky Bourbon Affair starts on Tuesday, June 6th, and it concludes on Sunday, June 11th. Visit kybourbonaffair.com to purchase tickets and get more information. We'll see you at the Kentucky Bourbon Affair. Hey everyone, so this is our first ever video podcast. Now, if you're listening on iTunes, make sure you like our Facebook page because that's where we will begin posting all the new videos, but they're also going to be on YouTube as well. Now, if you're watching the video, you're probably going to say, so what's what's the big deal? It's the same background we see on all the podcast roundtables, right? Well, that's A, because I edited this one. Uh, B, I think we'll probably get a better background, like maybe I'll do it in the basement with all my bottles behind it or something like that. But the next video that's gonna come out is gonna have animated graphics. My wife's gonna teach me how to do actual legit video production because that was like her career at one point, having lower thirds and all that kind of cool stuff. So it's a lot of fun new stuff to learn. So all the new video equipment was ordered this week, so it should be a fun new way forward. Uh, with that, I wanna say thank you everybody that is gonna support us. Since we are moving to video, This is we've got one more podcast to go after this that will not be video, it'll actually be audio only. And with that, we will uh, we'll see you all soon. We're going to take a few weeks off to make sure we get everything kind of ironed out. We're going to get some video taken care of. Uh, we got a barrel pick that we're going to do at uh, Russell's Reserve. We're going to video that and make that a podcast. So a lot of cool things that we have coming up. So I just hope that you all just bear with us as we try moving to this new format. And, uh, and yeah, I hope you really enjoy it. So enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. Kenny here. We've got the eighth edition, I believe, of the Bourbon Community Roundtable. It's always one of the, the crowd favorites where we get all of the, the biggest bloggers around this realm that kind of come together and talk about, well, what's happening with inside of bourbon. So we've got news, we've got different kinds of just topics that are things to kind of talk in mind. And this is all done on YouTube Live. So if you haven't caught this one, you know, we've been saying it for eight episodes now that uh, you can catch us all on YouTube live. We put the links out there on social media. So please come and join us. We've got everything happening. We got a uh, bunch. Uh, I think we got like, well, we got 37 people on the right now that are just watching and chatting along with us. And if you didn't miss, or if you didn't miss the last podcast, we had mentioned that we are going to be switching over to video. And this is, uh, this is going to be the first video that we're going to post. Uh, Cause we're not going to go crazy, but we've got a, a video editor that we've hired that we're going to have for doing a new intro video and all that sort of stuff that we'll get to in a video upcoming after this. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get this started. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, push it around the table to let everybody introduce themselves. And I'll start off with you first, Brian. Go for it. Yeah, uh, this is Brian Harrow with Sippin' Corn. You can find me uh, on Twitter at, at Sippin' Corn, S-I-P-P-N-C-O-R-N. Corn blog spot where I uh, mostly blogged about reviews and legal history. And somebody's got a kid there. I can hear that. Oh, like, that made not it. me. My fault. Not it. <laughs> <laughs> Life of pets apparently is He's on the only break. One who didn't hear it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I have that tuned out. <laughs> well, go ahead, Blake. We got you on the hook. So go ahead and okay. introduce yourself. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry about that. I'm Blake from bourboner.com. Uh, you can find me at bourboner.com backslash blog or on social media, either uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. It's all bourboner except for Twitter, which is bourboner.com. And the guy who likes to give him all the shit, so uh, you're up suburbia. Oh, me? Oh. <laughs> hey, guys, this is uh, Kerry. I run uh, suburbia.com. That's S-U-B-O-U-R-B-I-A.com. You can find me on Twitter with the same name, at bourbon underscore gamer. And uh, you can buy my line of products. They are T-shirts that say Bourboner um, on them in honor of uh, Bourboner. That's the only time I'm going to throw that joke out there because people – Apparently didn't like that I said it like three times in a podcast, so I'm just going to use it once. That's all good. And Nick, round us out. And I'm Nick, one of three guys behind Breaking Bourbon, breakingbourbon.com. You can find us online at uh, breakingbourbon.com for reviews, articles, and, of course, the release calendar. And then you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Breaking Bourbon. Sounds good. Uh, Blake, I'm keeping muting you until you until you get the kid to quiet down back there. So we're gonna it's gonna be like PTI around here. We're just gonna we're gonna keep it silent until you <laughs> until it's unmute to myself. Off. Okay, he's in bed. We're <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so uh, first kind of question tonight, you know, this is uh, this is Brian kind of talked it up and they said this is gonna be our Derby Week special because it is the Kentucky Derby that's happening around here. You know it's Derby season. I actually put this down on our Twitter handle uh, a few days ago. You know it's Derby season around here when all of a sudden Craigslist starts blowing up and says, all right, $2,000 for a bottle of Pappy 20 for your Derby party uh, because that's just what happens, right? Everybody starts wanting to throw out their, their Pappy bottles for sale. So uh, I know I was late tonight because I was having a, a midweek Derby party, but do you guys have any Derby parties or Derby plans coming up this weekend? Well, it starts uh, now. Um, Kenny, you'll know this, but uh, for everybody else, the locals start on Thursday now with uh, with Thurby, which my wife uh, is claiming royalties on that she named about ten years ago. So I'm starting Thursday and then going uh, uh, Friday for Oaks into the infield, and then uh, Derby party on Saturday. You're infielding it, huh? So are you oh, yeah. going crazy? Uh, no, I'm the responsible adult for a bunch of sixteen year old girls. Oh. <laughs> I do not envy you yeah. one bit. They, they check in every hour on the hour before we, <laughs> we go home. And you out of towners? Are you guys uh, you guys catching any horse racing this weekend, or are you uh, just continue on just mowing the grass as usual? What? Yeah. Uh, go, ahead. go ahead. I was gonna say, there's a horse race this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say we we sometimes bet on it a little bit, um, but you know it's. We're more worried about the TPC in two weekends than we are about the Derby this weekend. So um, not a whole lot of action, at least in Jacksonville, with the Derby. I, I think everybody watches it mm -hmm. uh, you know, around the country. We just don't make a whole week out of it um, or a day even, honestly. I mean, we, we'll make an excuse to make some, um, some mint juleps and um probably turn on the tv about 5 p.m or whatever so and watch it and it's always you know i mean it's one of those events that it's it's like the olympics you know you you um you got to watch it just because it's on and you want your children in there to watch it because such of the you know the history and the tradition of it but yeah i think outside of kentucky um, maybe we don't go as crazy as you guys do yeah i've been there I was in the infield uh once that was uh, that was a lot of fun i will say it does seem like a, it's a lot more popular now too. A lot of people do talk about mint juleps. I don't remember that five years ago, eight years ago, whereas now maybe just because they know I'm into bourbon, but it seems like the popularity has risen quite a bit over the past few years. Well, sounds good. I, uh, I know we talked about mint juleps a little bit. For anybody that didn't catch it on our Facebook page, I put my, my own private batch recipe that I do for uh, mint julep. So every year, Ryan, he's not with us tonight, but Ryan throws a pretty pretty good sized derby party every single year and i bring a, a huge batch of mint juleps with us and uh it's a way better than anything that you can buy off the shelf um so i put the recipe out there for anybody that's looking to make your mint juleps go over there and, and go check it out hey, yeah, do not the, buy off the shelf do not do not do not buy off the shelf exactly there's a good question in the chat about the derby from uh michael who said is there is it true there's a woodford reserve cocktail drink that costs one thousand at churchill downs 
Yes, that is very, very true. And actually, we get the uh, opportunity uh, here in Louisville, um, at least for a lot of the bloggers and people around here, we get press releases about it all the time. And they say it's the Woodford Reserve $1,000 mint julep. And we get to, and actually, if you catch, I believe it was this time last year is when we had um, uh, Woodford Reserve on the podcast. I don't know if it was Jackie or somebody else. Um, it might've been, I think it was Chris Morris actually. So we had Chris Morris on the podcast and he actually started talking about the, the Woodford Reserve $1,000 mint julep, uh, that was happening. So yes, it does happen every single year. There was one year where they actually had ice that was shipped in off a glacier that they had chipped off. Hell out of here. That was one year. And that was like the one that like made it like really special that everybody always talked about. That was just one time though. So Ever since then, it's just a, a hyped up way to, it's it's also like selling a lot of stuff for charity too. So consider it for that. It's not that you're just uh, getting gold flakes inside of your mint jewel. Well, what are you getting in the $1,000? Hopefully a horse to go along with your mint julep for a thousand bucks. <laughs> you wish. Oh, a thousand dollars might pay for oats for like a week, right? So, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I do know you you actually get the cup. So the sterling cups that you uh, that you you know you always see those famous sterling cups for mint juleps. You actually do get the cup that goes along with it. It is not a thousand dollar cup, so always keep in mind that it is for charity. Um, I believe at the end of the day. So, so understand that. Yeah, if it's for charity, good for them then. I mean, they're not going to get my money, right? I, mean, like, <laughs> I still want, like, if it's glacier ice, like, is there going to be a locket from the Titanic on there or something? Like, <laughs> Only one way to find out. Yeah. But, yeah. You got to come here and buy it, man. <laughs> we'll send you a, a, a CD with, uh, you know, the, the theme song from it just to make sure that you uh, oh, never forget it. Can I can I hold Blake while we're listening to the song? <laughs> Maybe you can paint him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, stay, let's, stay let's, tuned for the for the after. This is only for the uh, the folks that that are on Patreon. <laughs> this is what happens when we start late. Everyone's been drinking too much already. There's way too many Titanic references. There's I know, and you know what? I actually did some. I actually looked back at it. We haven't had a. a a round table and I think almost five weeks. So it's been over a month since our last one. So oh, man, uh, long. We, we've got some things to catch up on. That's for yeah, sure. Well, thank you, Michael, for the question too. Yes, absolutely. So let's go ahead and let's, let's jump into it a little bit. So Pappy 25 is out. Um, who cares? That's yeah. Let's, let's, let's be honest. Like um, if it falls into your lap, would you buy it? Um, or would you just, basically just say like, I'm going to buy it to sell it only because it is what it is. Or do you think you're going to buy it just to, to hold on to it? Or is it just one of those things? Cause in my opinion, I'm not even chasing after it. There's just no point 700 across the country. Everybody that is any kind of representative of a potato is going for it. And I just don't care. Yeah. Yeah. And what's, what's retail on it? 1900, 1800, I think 1800, 11,000. They go for really? Yeah. Yeah. And that's where it's like, I mean, I hate to say who cares because it is really cool. I mean, it's 25 years. There's only so many of them. They did a great job with the branding. The box looks cool. But at the end of the day, you know, that's the niche of the small portion of the market that actually cares. It is interesting that, I mean, I guess because it has Pappy on the name, but they've been able to do that a whole lot better than you know, basically Michter celebration sits on bar shelves across the country. And, um, I can't imagine is that, that this 25 year tastes all that much better than anything else, either the 23 or like the Michter celebration with, and I, I don't know, I just, I can't wrap my head or head around it at this point. Um, but for some people, I guess it's pretty cool. I, I think it's more of a collector's item than anything, than a bottle of bourbon. And Eric Mancarelli, he, he did correct me. It is technically old Rip Van Winkle 25 year. We can't call it Pappy 25, but it's just thought, easy. It's just the easy way to just throw it in there. Yeah, I thought somebody said they did. Wasn't there Pappy on something? Maybe I think there was box. Pappy on the shipping box that it came Oh, with. that's what it was. That's, that's what, what I saw. Was. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this represents kind of the epitome of where where bourbon is. You know, it's. Yeah. It, I mean, it, you had a for the OFC, you had charity behind it. You had two hundred bottles, right? Fewer bottles. I mean, this you got more bottles. You you know, if you think of the kind of the peak peak of bourbon right now with what people are going to buy for something that comes out, not something that's real old, that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, real old as far as released years ago. This is, I think, kind of it. That Pappy name really takes it so far, like you said, Blake. Or the old Rip Van, Van Winkle name, but either way, the association that we all know what it is. Yeah. Here's the only thing that pisses me off about this, and it really it is that he threw you threw you under the, the bus the on only Twitter. Thing? Is it? <laughs> well, besides the whole fucking bullshit answer on Twitter, this is my thing about it. Okay. There's more than one thing, Kerry. I'm getting into it. <laughs> This is my only thing. Here's five Buffalo of them. Trace found 200 barrels or, or 200 bottles of really old bourbon. They decided to, to send them all to charity. They raised over, what, $10 million for charity for these bottles. Cool as shit on their part. Julian Van Winkle walks in and says, damn, we've got a couple barrels here of 25-year pappy. Let's fucking create a nice fancy wooden box and slap a $1,800 retail label on it and send that shit out to the market with like 700 bottles. I mean, did you need more hype and praise and money in the bourbon world? Like that would have been the perfect opportunity for them to come back with something charitable as well and say there, this Pappy 25 is, is rare. We're going to also do maybe half of these to charity, uh, follow along the footsteps of Buffalo Trace, who is making all of our stuff. But no, it was, let's put a fancy engraved bottle and a fancy box and send that shit out. And before it even hits the market, it's going to be worth five times its retail price and it's going to be amazing everyone's going to talk about it that's the bullshit that i don't like about it i i love i don't how hold buffalo trace responsible for this because i think that with the ofc stuff i mean like i said they, they raised a whole bunch of money and at the end of the day the van winkle family is going to tell them what they want so if they say we want to bottle up these 710 bottles we're going to bottle them up regardless of what bt thinks so i just think it's kind of a shitty move on on beat on a Van Winkle's part. Yeah, I, I think that's a no-win situation, though, because who knows how that actually worked? Like, did they two years ago just say, "Hey, let's sit on a couple barrels of the twenty-three year and wait and see what happens," or I don't know. And maybe I'm just less offended by money grabs than <laughs> than most, because um, they have this. You know, it's kind of like striking when the iron's hot, um, but. I don't know. I, I guess I see your point on that one, but I, I'm less less offended if you know they are a business; they're not a charity. So my point or my uh, take on that is always, you know, make your charity charity, make your business business. Who who knows what they do personally? Maybe they give all their money personally to charity, but I'm really, not trying to. I'm not trying to defend the Van Winkles. I just don't have a problem with businesses making money because that's you know that that's the point of it. But that's the I don't have a problem personally. Out. I have a problem with the the company or the okay. organization. It is a really small brand, though. I mean that that shipment of old Rimf and Winkle each year that's that's relatively small. You know this what's this going to be one point three million dollars worth of sale? I mean th they are kind of striking when the iron's hot, I and mean, it is hard to blame them for that. And it does kind of hold with the name too. You know it's the epitome of bourbon. You know what do you do to the feel of it if you do half for charity? half for auction you know that that made sense for buffalo trace i think i'm not sure for the pappy van winkle the old riff van winkle name that's really in line with you know how people kind of view them so i'm not really surprised by it at all i can't say i'm surprised at all but at the same time I'm also not all that interested in it either you know it's it's the hype train i mean even at msrp or a little more you know the stuff is good but it's not it's not worth 10 times what it you know what it goes for msrp i mean that's that's insanity but it's worth a ten thousand dollar bottle what what's worth an eighteen hundred dollar yeah, bottle yeah, yeah exactly turning, turning bourbon into scotch you know scotch had they always have like the here's a sixty thousand dollar fifty year old you know fifty right. year old bottle i think they're just trying to get to that where uh, and i'm surprised they didn't they didn't start with a higher msrp mm -hmm. frankly and i'm not they offended by it I'm not going to chase it. I don't want to buy it. I'm not interested in it. See, Mickner's doing a $5,000 celebration. I'm surprised they're not doing a $5,000 25. Yeah. Did, didn't somebody say that that uh, the 
uh, Buffalo Traces, the charity bottle was actually just going to be a lead in for them to release a much higher retail bottle. Oh, I'm sure it is. It's got to be. Regardless, the they raised over 10 million for charity. Oh, no, no, no. That's, which, I, I agree. Which is awesome. I mean, I think that's a. It, it it's a win win. At the end of the day, said we've got 200 bottles worth of stuff from between 80 and 82. We can either release this for a crap load of money or just mm -hmm. give it to charity and let them make some money, which. It was a great tax write-off for themselves. Sure. <laughs> and publicity. The they got a ton of publicity. <laughs> and who doesn't? Yeah, publicity was Look great. at me right here saying they're singing their praises while they're, you know, putting out three Eagle Rare 17 barrels per year. But I'm saying, like, it's, it's, still, <laughs> it's still great on their part. No, no, it, it, I agree. So, have you actually seen one in person yet? I've seen two in person. The 25? Yeah. Yes. And they're behind him right now. Yeah, <laughs> I wish they were both like, "Hey, look at what we got!" And um, both of them went to people who spent money that I couldn't, I wouldn't even make in two years in a store in a year. Or so you buying can't, nothing but wine, probably. Yeah, you can't compete with that. Yeah, as a normal everyday bourbon lover, unless you've won the lottery, you can't compete. Yeah, it's uh, at least around here. It's the same story as usual. We've got. Plenty of retailers that are charging uh, five to six thousand for it because it's a three tiered system and you can do that. But I think people are, if they know they can get nine or ten grand for it, they're going to drop six grand on it and they're going to go try to take the easy three K out of it, which you can't blame them, right? Um, but still, it's it's the nature of of how bad this game is. And just to kind of go back on what Blake said of of having this become the Scotch World uh, twenty two catch twenty two said. McCallan just came out with a 65 year for $35,000. Oh. So just gives you an idea of how. But it's not just international. You know, somebody is, is. is going to buy that internationally who, who has billions of dollars and nothing else to buy. Is that full of bourbon, Carrie? <laughs> <laughs> Carrie yeah. drinking a water jug full of that's bourbon. That's my tennis there. jug right there. Yeah. Happy, yeah. happy yeah. 25 in there. That's where one of the bottles were. Yeah. <laughs> Who needs a, a brown paper bag when you can just hide a bottle in, <laughs> in an igloo carrying case? I've got a patent on that. Don't don't try to take yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brian's working on it for me. I want to hear Brian's uh, sipping corn's take on it. On on the pappy? Yeah, the twenty five. Yeah, I mean, like like I said, it's I'm surprised they didn't charge more on suggested retail. I mean, I mm -hmm. I expected this to be their five thousand dollar equivalent of celebration. And they'd sell every one at it, and all the retailers would jack it up from even that price. So, I, I agree. It's 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 all about the business. It's all about the money for them. I, I agree with you, Carrie. It's not their style to do this as charity. I wouldn't expect that uh, on the on the Pappy brand or the Rip Van Winkle brand. And I, I don't begrudge him for it. Um, but I'm not going to chase it. I'm not going to look for it. Um, if uh, offered a drink of it, I'll. I'll see what I think about it, obviously, but I'm not looking for it. Would you pay 150 for a pour in a bar? No. No? No. I would if it was being expensed. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> that's, that's, uh, hey, all of us can write that off. Way. We can all write that off. Just got to find the right accountant. <laughs> there you, so, go. <laughs> you know, that's a good point. Like, is what if Mictor's celebration or, the, yeah, I guess celebration was the same as Pappy, as old Rip Van Winkle 25, would it still sell? What if it was both Stutzelweller um, bourbon, you know, 25 to 30 years old, would it still, like, if we knew for a fact, if Mictors came out and said, our celebration is 30 year old Stutzelweller bourbon, mm -hmm. would it sell out immediately? Yes, immediately in a heartbeat. It, it probably would, but it wouldn't have the same because they're just, everyone knows the Pappy name. And that carries it so much farther, I think. Like, I, I got a text today from a buddy who was like, hey, I'm in a golf tournament and they're selling, they're auctioning a bottle of Pappy 15 for $1,000. Should I bid on it? I'm like, N no, what? You don't even drink bourbon. I've, <laughs> I've given you really good bourbon at my house. You say it tastes terrible. Why would you spend $1,000? <laughs> Mix it with Coke. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, it's I, interesting, I, though, whether if, if Mictors just came out and said, hey, guess what? Our M20 is. Still, Stitzel Weller. Mm -hmm. Would it drive up the price double, triple? 
I think you Stitzel Weller would. I mean, that's the, the people who are buying that know the Stitzel Weller name and they'd buy it in a heartbeat. You I mean, that's still the rumor, think, right? For anybody that doesn't know, like M20 is still Stitzel Weller stock. It used to be, you know, Michter's 10 up until the end of 2014. Um, but as far as I understand, Michter's 20 is still Stitzel Weller stock. Am I, am I incorrect? They won't confirm it. They won't yeah. confirm it, but I've heard it from pretty, pretty reliable it, sources that, that it is. And my guess, the only reason by not confirming is because they don't want to tarnish the brand by saying, oh, it's going to be something completely different next year because we ran out of all the stuff that everyone likes. Right. right. So, um, so was I like it the, the 14 to 15 flip. There was a big difference between 14 and 15. Yes. Four, yeah, or 15 is pure old forester to me. But do you think without that Pappy name or that Rip Van Winkle name that just gets smeared all over the mainstream media, if it didn't have that and they're burying the Stitzel Weller name somewhere within an article or it doesn't even get picked up, would it have the same impact though? And would we see it? Well, they're not going to bury the name uh, anywhere. I mean, they'll. You, you've seen everyone tout Stitzel Weller as hard as they can. Yeah, the nerds will dig it up. I think, <laughs> no right? Matter where it's, uh, but so. outside of that community, though, yeah, that's can't that's be any what I think. Well left anywhere, can there? I don't know. I didn't think there was a lot of this stuff sitting. I, I would think it's pretty much all gone by now. All right, it's still but out after, there. After Diageo did their one barrel of the blade and bow, and, and that's coming out again. That's coming out again for Derby. Yeah, Derby. Really? Well, so that was only a slight. A little bit of um, Stitzel Weller mixed with a whole lot of not Stitzel Weller, right? If I, I thought the right. one they did, the Indiegogo one, on right? I think, was... I think the 22 years is all Stitzel Weller. The, the no age statement one is a drip of Stitzel Weller. It can't be all. It was like 120 when it first came out. It was like there was so much of it, and it was like 100. It was like the same stuff as Lost Profit. Oh, well, you're, you're right. You're, they, it was a blend of. I think uh, of old Bernheim and Stitzel yeah. Weller. Yeah. Okay. Did they do like, was that the one they did like Solera aging on or was yes. that the, the they, small batch? That was a Solera age. Plus their regular blade and bow was Solera aging like right. 0.001% Stitzel Weller mixed with the rest. I think it was just the small batch. I don't think it was the old stuff that was Solera aged. Okay. So you they kind of lose the, track of that age in that. Blade and Bow 22 was all Stitzel Weller. Right, they had to keep the 22-year age statement so they couldn't blend with younger stuff. So that's, I think it's a blend oh. of, of uh, old Bernheim and Stitzel Weller, all, but all 22. <laughs> but all 22, yeah. But I'm guessing they never said what percentages were what. Right, right. I never saw them. They, they never revealed that. But they'll yeah, tell you what Blood Oath is <laughs> all day long. You love your blood oath. I tried that blood oath live here, didn't I? Yeah. I'll need to go yeah. review uh, Bourbon Podcast 7 for my live take on Blood Oath 3. <laughs> it's a solid $50 bottle. <laughs> let's, let's, let's say it rhymes with his, uh, his thoughts of Blood Oath 1 and 2. So. Exactly. <laughs> All right, cool. So I want to kind of move it on to a, a little bit different direction. And this is, this is something that I found super interesting and – so just to give anybody an idea who, who's watching this, I usually tend to throw the questions I'm going to ask these guys um, a little bit earlier on just so they have time to either prepare, kind of figure out like what kind of answers they want to throw. But this one, I kind of want to throw it as a little bit of a curveball because I read this and I was a little flabbergasted. And this is kind of news that it's coming out of Bullet. And this is coming out of a, a Facebook group that's out of Houston. And there is a uh, there's a certain someone that everybody knows, but I'm not going to say it just to keep the the innocent innocent here. But he had a post and it said it's widely known that Bullet Bourbon was sourced by Diageo from Four Roses for for years. We've all we've all known that, right? We've all known that Four Roses or sorry that that um, that Bullet Bourbon is we think is just Four Roses, right? But the contract ended a few years back, and they were buying fresh distilled bourbon and aging it for many years to come. And Bullet's still going to be continue the source for that. However, um, there was a good response back, and it's from Cheryl. Al Al sorry, Cheryl Alagna. Cheryl is a retired master of master of whiskey from Diageo and worked very close with Bullet for eleven years, and she's also a certified distiller. So listen to this. 
The bullet that was contracted to be produced at the Four Roses Distillery was a proprietary mash bill, corn, rye, and source, and a proprietary yeast strain that was used. So not one of the five yeast strains that are actually coming from Four Roses. Aging the casts were also set by Tom Bullet and his team. He has a mash bill of bullet as two-thirds corn, one-third rye, with a teeny amount of malted barley to facilitate fermentation. That mash with a proprietary yeast and grain bill is totally different than any Four Roses that uses in their cash strength and is exactly the same mash bill as all other Bullet Bourbon Marquis. It does not have any Four Roses lineage whatsoever other than where it's made. So what do you guys think about that? So you're saying this an 11th recipe that is used at Four Roses only for Bullet? Exactly. Well, and so there's, there's, there's actually more than the 10... Sorry, Blake. There's actually more than the ten already that 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 generally the public doesn't know about, and I've confirmed with um, with Jim and Brent. There's a there's another yeast out there, and I've I've posted a picture from the Bullet Tasting Room that shows this uh, this last yeast this last yeast. So everyone knows the, uh, the 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 main yeast. There's also a E yeast. D is it dog? He is an echo, I think he said. Echo. Okay. Uh, but I don't know if that's I don't know if that's what Bullet used. But there's an E yeast. And the last the letter they use. Right? Yeah. Okay. So it would be O E S E, for example. Um, and then the drawers at the Bullet Tasting Room used to be labeled in the tasting lab. Used to be labeled. And you would see the Four Roses recipes. You would see OESF, you'd see OBSQ, you'd see all of those drawers labeled, and they take those labels off and start asking questions. Of. But then there were also other labels. There was the, then after that, it was the at symbol LDI. Hmm. So they're also apparently getting bourbon from Lawrence, Indiana. And then there's other codes. There's old, there was LJSS. There's all these other codes on these drawers. So it's it's a true, you know, mad scientist tasting lab that they've got there. And I, I've got no idea, no, in, no information on what Bullet actually is. I always assumed it was a 20% rye recipe and you take the 35% rye recipe and you get some, um, you know, new basically four rows of small batch. And that's what you end up getting your 28% rye for Bullet. But I got no information other than that. Is bullet still? Do they do they say bullet is still the same recipe than it that it's been, or they've changed source for it? So, uh, other than the new distillery, well, they don't talk, they don't talk about the source. Talk about the source, but if if you go on the on the uh, on the Stitzel Weller tour and start sneaking behind it when you're in the warehouse, you will see barrels that are marked Claremont. It. <laughs> the people who sit there. There's a uh, uh, brown foreman trucks that leave at 3 a.m. every night and go straight to Stitzel Weller. So they're already getting sourced from elsewhere. Uh, I know and that who knows, um, who knows? Claremont was doing some of their rye, I believe it was. Um, oh, in addition to Lawrenceburg? Yeah. They, they were contracting. Yeah. Now, he didn't tell me if it was um, – if it was for the bourbon as well, he's like, yeah, you know, however many days a week they uh, um, they were distilling for bullet for the rye, um, which was interesting because I thought that would be all. I thought it was all MGP. That's what I thought, yeah. and, yeah. and yeah. it could have been. It, it was a it was a beam employee, but not like you know. It always had that taste too. It had yeah, that. not like high up. Well, well, this was only a couple of years ago, so I don't even think this stuff is on the market yet. I think the thinking was things could go. It's on these barrels, Claremont barrels that I saw are all within the last couple of years. Yeah, it, and it would make more sense if it was the bourbon that. But I've heard, you know, obviously the brown forming connection. Them saying um, that. Uh, that that would make more sense. I was trying to find something. I don't know. I'd have a hard time believing with as much bourbon as Bullet sold, Four Roses had this special recipe and had enough of it to keep them supplied for however many years 
when it was really going. Yeah, you know, maybe some of that special recipe got mixed in, but um, I don't know. Whenever I talked to the Diageo people, the only thing I could really get confirmed about being, you know, the Bullet's trade secret was whenever um, Tom Bullet first started and he contracted with Buffalo Trace or Ancient Age, whoever it was at the time and was doing something different with the aging, which was basically just a heated warehouse. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I'm sure that lady knows what she's talking about, but I'd have a hard time believing all bullet in the bottle was a special recipe in yeast and everything from four roses. But we read it on the internet. So yes. <laughs> I want to go ahead and point that out. Like she did word it really well. I it was in that. a group. Yeah. On Facebook, on the uh, internet. By oh. the way, it checks out. She's on LinkedIn. She does work for Diageo, so it does check out. Hmm. So she okay. still works for Diageo. Yes. And she's wow. still trade she's secrets a, she's like a retired, that. Retired master of because remember uh, Diageo actually got rid of their master of whiskey program, right? Mm -hmm. So she's technically a retired master of whiskey. Did they make anything? <laughs> uh. No, I think they just knew how to taste. They just mastered it. Well. Yeah, <laughs> but I would but think I mean, if if anything, they'd be good for the brand too. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's good information for the brand though too. I mean, does it does it make you like Bullet more or less? To believe, I think it's them? awesome. It's Bullet's like a great right? damn mystery now. What the hell yeah. is it actually I'm, made of? Right. I mean, more and if curious. they're doing more of it themselves, yeah, I they get a little more credit. Two thousand twelve Bullet. Now for like a hundred bucks a bottle, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go buy it up right now. The no, you got to find the old bottles that say Lawrenceburg on the back. Oh shit! I do. Are they bottled in bond? <laughs> I uh, hold on. Oh, here he's gonna, he's gonna go dig so in. That they'll have the he's DSP. Got right now. He, he's got he's got to go dig in his archives. Um. So anyway, <laughs> you know, while while he's gonna go and do that, I I'm, I kind of agree with you, Carrie. You know, I I think Blake's kind of playing the devil's advocate here, but I I, I also think that what this information kind of came to light. The fact is that oh, the old me, one. Oh yeah. So Blake's showing his uh, old pretty much original bullet label over here. Yeah. yeah. And that it it is com it. completely that's buffalo, different. That's the Buffalo trace one. Yeah. That's the new one. No, that's the Buffalo. No, no, trace. This, this oh, is right, from, this is it, it's uh, well, it calls it bullet distilling company, but Frankfurt, Kentucky. Okay. Yeah. So it kind of what I was telling on is saying is like for for me it kind of renews a little bit of, or re-energizes my faith in bullet a lot more right because whenever I'd go out or something like that and people say like oh, I'll take a bullet and I'm like what an idiot like it's just four roses like just buy your, get four roses because honestly for the longest time I just thought it was some blend of one of the mash bills that they already had uh, I honestly thought it was and then this information coming out that they have their own proprietary yeast strain that they've been using and contract distilling with their own uh, you know different mash bill I, I kind of think it it puts it in a whole different category for me that it's a little bit more respectable now don't get me wrong when I taste it um, as uh, somebody else was saying in here as well it, 22 catch 22 is saying is it still tastes a lot like four roses. I'm uh, not going to disagree with that, but I still think, uh, I think it, it opens up a little bit more, uh, I guess you say room for, um, you know, I guess trying to, trying to make it way to a, a routine of, of drinking for me a little bit, be just because I, I, I think it's interesting and in being able to know that it's just not regular sourced bourbon. That's just their own private blend or something like that. Right. Be nice to crap. think it, not just the same thing as something else in a different package. That's right. Absolutely. I, I agree it's not, with it's, that. Not, it's not another MGP. Let's put it that way, right? Yeah, agreed. Now, the rye would uh, be I, uh, another MGP. I just texted someone at Four Roses, so let's see what happens. Or <laughs> <laughs> now, um, now, by okay, the way, big time. she did go on to say, and she said that the new, new, the new distillery is up and running in Kentucky, which is in Shelbyville, which just opened. Uh, whiskey has been put down to age. It is running at full capacity. No production of bullet bourbon is actually happening at Dickel. Dickel is too small to do both Dickel and uh, bullet. Plus, Orphan Barrel is bottled at Dickel, which is very intensive. Bullet rye is still made at LDI MGP, but will soon be moving to the new distillery. Would you put me in this group? There's a lot of info. I need to become friends with this person. <laughs> Talk to me after the show. We can make it happen. Okay. Um, I do find that 
it's it's pretty interesting. I, I want to find out if there is a yeast, a sixth, a sixth yeast that is um that's not known by people. That would be really well, interesting. See, I mean, Why wouldn't they put it in a regular rotation? Seagram's had hundreds of yeasts, so you got to figure that they've been both at MGP and in at Four Roses. They've they've got access to those somehow or another. Yeah. And and with that with that drawer at at the Bullet Tasting Lab saying OESV at LDI, I mean that tells me that both both facilities have the same yeasts as well. Yeah, it's pretty so, yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's it's yeah that yeah. Is I like very it. interesting. Okay, so cool. So we kind of touched on that. Um, I can hear my kid run upstairs right now, so I got to dart here for a second. So I want to let you all talk amongst yourselves. Um, <laughs> Danger. Bourbon Barrel Batch 011 wins best bourbon at San Francisco. Discuss. So MGP takes both, right? So <laughs> they've got the Barrel Batch and they've got Whistle Pig. I mean, yeah. Is this, uh, is this the crowning uh, achievement uh, for MGP? No, that was made in, oh, in yeah, that Tennessee. Was Right. Whistle Pig was Alberta, yeah. wasn't it? No, uh, Fred. Fred corrected it today, today that it was actually MGP. Really? That's what I, I Whistle assumed. Whistle Pig that has it always been MGP. No, no, not always. No, 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 just no. this one that won. Okay. Dog that won. Huh. I, I assumed it was Alberta too. It tastes but totally I, different from it than NG, MGP. I, I agree. I totally agree. It was the but one. Is, it was the most recent Boss Hog that won. I think so. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so they had they 13 could have just changed. I haven't had the most yeah, recent one. That makes sense, yeah. I've heard um, great things about barrel. I have never, to my to this day, had a single bit of barrel bourbon. It's, some of it's, some it's of it's that's from out. Tennessee has, has some of that Flintstones in it, mm. but not as much as you get with, with Dickel at all. Um, but the uh, when they've bottled the MGPs, it's been great. Mm-hmm. So this yeah, is, I mean, I've heard it's really good. I just, I have not, I don't see it in Atlanta anywhere. I, I, I like, I liked 11 a lot. Um, I thought it was really good. In other news, uh, apparently he submitted um, Joe at Barrel, one of the, it, it ended up being the single barrel that we picked through Bourboner, and it won gold. So I, oh, I wanted to uh, go ahead and pat myself on the back for a second. Gold medal, bro. <laughs> But I think gold is actually like the lowest. There's like quadruple gold, triple gold, platinum. double gold, yeah. platinum, yeah, diamond, and then hey, just don't knock gold. yourself, man. Yeah, Listen, yeah. you are a big deal. Yeah, that's. I just want to make sure that was out there. It's, that's awesome. I'll be um, selling my bottle for fifteen hundred dollars later. So I haven't had barrel, but I've heard good things, and um, people seem to like them. It seems to be a, a good owner, good company. So, you know, hopefully um, they'll come to Atlanta at some point. I wish good things for them. Yeah. No, I actually yeah, and they're doing more board. private barrels, too. And mm-hmm. Go ahead, Kenny. Oh, sorry. I, say, I haven't been searching for it. I actually haven't seen uh, Batch 11 around town yet. Just haven't really looked for it. So, Brian, I don't, I don't know about you. Uh, I haven't seen 11 either. I haven't tried it. Um, but I, what I was saying is they're, they're, they have a decent uh, private barrel selection program, too. Yeah. So some of the stores have had it. Liquor Barn has had a really good uh, barrel bourbon. Uh, some some groups I know um, have been able to get uh, bottles of, or barrels of of barrel bourbon. So they're I think they're doing the right things. They've got a rye coming out soon too. It's uh, if they? I remember correctly, it's it's coming out. I think it's fifty one percent rye. I want to say forty nine percent malted barley from MGP. I believe so. When they switched over their mash bill, that's my guess. Hasn't been really announced or disclosed too much, but we haven't really seen any of that from anyone yet. Big surprise, a ride, another ride coming on MGP, right? <laughs> yeah. So In- I, I do find it interesting that all these uh, sourced companies now have their own distilleries, right? You have Bullet, you have Angels Envy, you have Whistle Pig. Everybody's making their own stuff. Even um, what Lux Barrel called. now has their own. Barrel right. Luxco now. So in ten years, is it going to be a glut? I mean, I know this is we bring this up every time, but oh if yes, just hang out ten more years. Is there going to be a tremendous glut of bourbon that there's just too much for us to buy? I think so. I, I don't think there's going to be any shortage of it. It's going to be 
uh, it's going to be the the 1920s of whatever all over again, where there's just going to be so much whiskey that you'll be going down the aisles and you'll have no idea what to purchase. Uh, yeah. I think there will be a lot. My my big hold up is it is trying to figure out will these small craft ones actually be able to survive and take on the big guys. That's that's mine. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I think there's a, a lot of stills you can buy in about five years if <laughs> if we want to pool our money together and start a distillery, they'll yeah. be stills for sale. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely I, right. I mean, you, everybody can't is everybody can't compete against each other. It's just it's the way a market works, right? You you flood a market and eventually there's too much of a product and people are going to back away. And they're going to sell and they're going to go away a little bit. And there's just going to be so much product in 10 years. But it's exciting for us because as, as bourbon enthusiasts, well, we're going to want to try all this different stuff. That's right. But and prices will go down. Prices will go down. But to the average everyday guy who has a liquor store who can only hold so much on his shelves, he's going to want the names that people know. Right? So I just think it's going to be. It'll be interesting to see. I think we still have a long way to go before we get to what we might consider a glut or even the bubble bursting. I think we're still a little ways off, but it's in the foreseeable future, I think. I think it's how you define that too, because you could in some ways say there's a glut right now. I mean, anywhere you go, a lot of places, there's plenty of stuff. It's just, do they have those couple things, those couple special things that are highly sought after that you're looking for? You know, Pappy's hard to find. BTAC is hard to find. Certain limited release stuff is hard to find. I know Blanton's is hard to find in some areas. You know, but there's tons of other choices. It's just our our people looking for that stuff. I mean, you have plenty of options right now. As the craft stuff floods the market, there's going to be even more. So we'll think of that glut as like when the high end stuff ends up just kind of sitting, and all of it sits. You know, so is that ever going to happen? Is there even enough of it? you know, to recognize that, you know, is Pappy ever going to sit from this point forward? Probably not. So yeah. here's a, here's a question that came from uh, 22 again. He says the big guys are gonna have to up their game or squire the craft games like barrel. And, and when I think about this, I kind of think about it from like a tech perspective, right. Of, of why big companies swallow up startups or something like that. And when I, when I think about what's happening in whiskey, it doesn't really change the fact of like, you're not making a better product. Like you're not, you're not reinventing the game per se. You're just buying more stock. You're buying, you're buying bigger distribution. You're buying more things. So I don't, I don't think that in regards of being able to, um, that big guys have to up their game, like change the, change the scenario to think that like, I mean, think about it, like banks, all of a sudden, like small banks that know how to like do online transactions and uh, all those kinds of things in online banking, how they kind of disrupt a lot of older guys way back in the day. Um, they don't really have to worry about that per se, right? I think it's a, it's a different industry per se. Uh, so I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Uh, do you think the, the, the big companies have to change or adapt? Do you think it's just, we'll just swallow up little companies and we will just have a, a bigger footprint as we go towards the market. I think we will see more of that swallowing the companies. I mean, I know that yeah. uh, Abraham Bowman swallowed up by Sazerac, for example, but they really kept their, you know, their hometown feel. What's that? West Virginia, I think, where they're located as an example. Um, you know, are there going to be enough craft distilleries that take a big enough bite? I mean, you're seeing ones right now like Barrel that are really making a splash, but at the end of the day, I mean, they're really small production. Is that digging into, you know, the big guy's sales? Are they really after that? I'm not sure that they are. And I think if anything, they may swallow up those few really, really special ones that hold a lot of potential. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of those craft guys are just going to fold on their own. You know, the best ones, do they get swallowed up? Do they go separate? Do they get bought out like we're seeing with High West and these others? That's probably going to continue to see more of that. I agree. So High West and Smooth Ambler are going to be the, the easy targets. And, and frankly, Barrel will probably be a target with as well as, as they've been doing. Um, but they're not competing with the, with the yellow labels and the Buffalo Trace label, the, the, the normal Buffalo Trace label and the Heaven Hill six-year bottle and bond. I mean, they're, they're all going for the, 50 to $90 price range. So I think there's room for all of the 
ten dollar bottles to ten to twenty five dollar bottles, and then the the crafts will keep charging their fifty to nineties. I think uh, there was a someone in chat who said um, Eric said it's similar to the craft beer boom that's been going on for like five plus years. And as it's been going on for five plus years, I still find myself hunting for KBS and Bourbon County Stout and uh, Bell's Black Note, even though I look at a shelf just filled with Imperial Stouts. It's it's all in the name. It's all in the hype. It's in the, you know, you you ask somebody else, man, what beer should I be looking for? And it's it's just one of those things where I think that the shelves will be filled and there'll be a ton of bourbon, but the name Pappy is going to be around for so long and antique collection will be around for so long. And, you know, a lot of uh, the Parker's heritage collection, I, I still think the people who put their roots in before the craft distillers really came in are the ones whose name is going to persist beyond that. I want to address a question came up here from Eric uh, in the chat. Why do they have to fold or become top tier? Tier, isn't it possible they sit somewhere in the middle? I think referencing the craft, you know, I, I I think, yes, it is probably possible they sit somewhere in the middle, but it's can they get to the middle enough before they run out of money, you know, is going to be the question. Can they fund operations? Can they make a living out of it when their loans run out, when their grants run out, whatever, you know, and that's going to be the question. So you got to get big enough. You got to get a big enough distribution to make that happen, you know, and it's very enticing when you're killing it you know, for other big companies to come in and say, hey, I, I'm looking to just change out my branding. Here's a hundred million dollars. How do you say no to that? And you can still run your operation and do it better. So I no, see I, that happening and I see others just not making it, not quite getting to that point where they can pay, keep, keep the lights on, you know? I totally uh, can see where you're coming from. I mean, there's, uh, there's no shortage of craft distilleries that are happening around here in Louisville and I, I honestly think they throw more money into the marketing right now than they are into actually like what they're selling. And it, it's definitely, it's proving to the, the point, like it's working right now, right? It, it's working in regards, to they have marketing, they can, they can get people out to events. Um, but how long can they sustain that level of just pushing a product that maybe it's not going to just start flying off the shelves, right? And I, 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 when we talk about craft, it always reminds me of the episode that we had with Ed Bly on. And he always said, it's, it's so easy to sell your first bottle. It's that second bottle is where it really becomes difficult. And yeah. so when they need to really have a, a killer product out there is when it's going to start becoming more of a, a do or die time for a lot of them. So we'll so go Blake, ahead. And, you've got some guys on the go ahead, uh, on the comments drinking your uh, your barrel bourbon. They're enjoying it. Wise choice for the day. Wise yes, all that. Is. Yeah. <laughs> peanut butter flavor. Tyson peanut butter flavor. Peanut I saw that. <laughs> what they don't know is I actually dropped a peanut butter sandwich in when we're <laughs> That's blending. That's what it was. <laughs> oh, those are those chunks <laughs> floating around. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I tasted some <laughs> rainbow bread in there. You yeah. thought it was barrel char. No, it was Marita. <laughs> 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 so uh, this is a question that comes from Quinn English, and I know Blake has done it. So has uh, this is it's just now started sweeping across the country. It's all over the forums. Has anyone tried uh, E.H. Taylor Four Grain, and what are your thoughts? I personally haven't tried it yet. Um, I know Blake had a good thirty-minute review on his on his Facebook page, but uh, anybody else that wants to talk about it, please uh, please share. I haven't tried it. I'll pass to you guys. There it is. Carrie's <laughs> Carrie's got a sample bottle. I don't need thirty me. minutes to spread my gospel. Please, please, Carrie, give us your your honest feedback and review because I know it's going to be legit. It's not that good. There we go. So this is this Politics. is my thought, right? This is my thought, and the fact that uh, I love the bullshit story that they said of like, oh, these are the four grains that each Colonel Taylor would have had around during that time, like whatever like save us save us the story but the thing is is that you know most bourbons are made with primarily three grains right you got you know corn malted barley and either rye or wheat and now they want to put both of them in and if by some chance in the past hundred and whatever many years this has been going on if they realize that if you put all four of these grains together it made a better product they would have been doing it all along 
yeah. right? So when you put out a limited release of something that has something that is not an experiment, like it's been done plenty of times, I, I think it's, I don't know. It's just, you're just catching people with a, with a hook at that point. Sure. It's a, it's a 12 year. Yeah. Totally marketing hook. Now, now on the other hand, if you guys have ever had the chance to home blend rare breed plus Bernheim wheat, it's, it's great. I mean, there is pain, um, but you're right that it's, it's in this case, it's just a marketing hook. Yeah. I, yeah, I, don't I think it's, I think it's a hot sell right now while you have it. I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> and I mean, no. but he's got a, he's got a Sazerac polo on. He won't show you the look. <laughs> that's underneath there, right? He's covering it right here. That's <laughs> Burke's <laughs> brothers. Let me um, ask you this though. Did, but, did it come from this or did it come from a bottle? No, it came from that. Okay. Sample bottle for anybody that's, that's yeah, not it was sample. It was pretty leftovers. good. I, I mean, I can't say I didn't like it. So now people will pay ridiculous prices for it, but I can't knock it because somebody's gonna be dumb and pay four hundred dollars for a bottle. Like I don't knock anything. I knock it when I try it. Okay, fair enough. I was just but that's fair. I mean, that, that, you know, different strokes for different folks. I so. thought it was pretty good. You know, but but I like E. H. Taylor too. Um, it didn't really fit most of what they put out, which that was kind of a whole another thing of. I'm still not sure what they're doing with the E.H. Taylor brand. Um, I think most people are a little confused. Yeah, by that. But um, as far as the bourbon go, I, th I thought it was pretty good. Um, I will say this about seasoned wood. When it first came out, I didn't like it. I've had a bottle open for about nine months. I went back to it recently, and I thought it was really, really good. Mm -hmm. So I – Maybe this is one of those bottles that is open for a while and it grows on me. I do know that when I try stuff from this small plastic 50 milliliter bottle, I usually end up finding that from the glass bottle later on, it tastes different. So now do you think that it truly judgment. tastes different or you think that's a mental thing of pouring it from a plastic bottle and your mind? No, because I usually you. will. This bottle usually goes to myself and three of my buddies who live in the okay. neighborhood. And we always try it. And almost always when we try the, the glass bottle of it, it's better than what's in this little bottle that they send out. I think it's not enough. I think it's not enough I volume. I, I think you need a little air time. Yeah. That first I thought, I pour. That out of the yeah, that first pour is rarely the best pour, I feel yeah. like. Yeah. Second, third, you know, after a week or so, that's when they tend to shine a little bit. Exactly. And we got yeah, a sample too. I yeah, didn't have like it. Two days, it's gone. So. They say we got a sample too. I didn't have it. Eric, Eric reviewed it. And he gave it a three and a half. Um, you know, it, it, again, you know, so it's 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 decent. Again, not really worth the craziness mm -hmm. based on that, but it seems to be that's what people are finding. I haven't really seen anyone that absolutely loved it. Yeah. No, I'm with you. I think, um, so it was, I, I believe a week or so ago and it was in usual Kentucky fashion that liquor barn sends out a mass email saying, these are the bourbons that we're going to release tomorrow morning. And, um, sure enough, people camped out for four grain. Right. And, uh, yeah, and that's just, that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, believe me. I, uh, for me being me, I had to sit there and I read the Breaking Bourbon reviews. I read some other ones and I said, you know what? I'm not even getting up at even 5 a.m. to wait in line. For this. So it was uh, it was a it was a way for me to try to show a little bit of uh, restraint in myself just to not stand in line for a few hours to wait for a bottle that, you know, is, is going to be subpar at the end of the day that I would probably just be better off getting my uh, my sleep in. So. Well, sometimes it, there's that, there's that gotta have it, you know, that's definitely going on with bourbon right now. And some people just want to get Omo. out of the house, you know, <laughs> Omo, exactly. Omo, that's right. Some people Omo. are just looking for a reason to camp out at a liquor store on a uh, random Tuesday night. Oh, Any reason to get out of the house. Acceptable. And yeah. by the way, this was this past weekend. It was a, it was damn near, a, it was a, a monsoon out there. It has like oh, miles an hour winds, oh right? They, no, was, thank you. Yeah, local Facebook group and people are posting pictures and videos of rain going sideways as they're sitting in front of a liquor store, right? So, 
Yep. Uh, we can say, I guess it's jumped a shark a little bit. So the one <laughs> thing that uh, Quinn also mentioned that everybody should know that if you are chasing after four grain, um, you, you've heard it from us that it's probably not worth the, the time and or effort unless it just falls into your lap, which of course, buy it, that's fine. But yeah. um, there is going to be a spring 2018 release that's been, that came out in the Buffalo Trace press release. So, you know, you've got this release. Uh, and as far as I understand that, the 2018 release for E.H. Taylor is also going to be four grains, so fret not, there is going to be a release again next year. Um, but with that, the price is already starting to fall in the secondary because of the amount that are showing up and um, the way this hobby has grown that people are going to start flooding the market as soon as it, as soon as it happens. So, yeah. isn't, there a, isn't there a lot of bottles of the four grain floating around? So I know that there is 3.5 times more four grain in the state of Georgia than there was seasoned wood. Okay. Boom. And seasoned wood was probably what? Four to five? Two, two cases. thousand bottles. <laughs> two cases in Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I thought they released number of barrels on one of them. I don't know Could be wrong. I'll have to go back and look. Huh. So, for for four grain, we could be looking at like, man, almost near fifteen, sixteen thousand bottles. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. That's so it. Far. That's probably that's probably about average. Yeah. All right, so uh, let's wrap this up. Um, Gilbert Zamora has one more question that says, "Do you guys ever plan on doing a round table barrel selection?" Uh, yes. Next yes. Week. Ooh, yeah, one let's of these do days. Do it. That'd be nice. So, yeah. Kenny, tell them about the hint about possibly the next podcast. Yeah, in the next podcast, we're going to be doing a barrel selection. No, I have actually no idea what we're going to be doing. So. I told you what we might do. What are we doing? We might have a representative from a big oh, distillery yeah. on with us. That's right. So That's we, we might – we yeah we we might we might try to get some uh, some surprise guests in here and we got a big dog coming on do do a Reddit AMA sort of thing as as Carrie likes to do so but, but not on. Reddit like we'll we'll ask we'll let the questions go ahead of time right we'll filter them but yeah we may have a a big dog distillery on with us next time to discuss their products and stuff absolutely and this was actually great to catch up with you guys it's actually been pretty light in the the world of bourbon news so. Um, yeah. it's, uh, that's actually kind of refreshing almost a little <laughs> bit, right? <laughs> well, light in the, in the world of bourbon news is, uh, there's a bill junior single barrel makers mark coming out. That's that will flop, right? I mean, who cares? I'm buying it. I'm buying a case <laughs> of it. I already ordered a case. So all right, good. No, if it. anybody can get their hands on a Cubs memorabilia world series, Jim beam bottle, know. Hit me up, Facebook, Twitter, That's right. uh, Instagram. How about I just send you a white label and I'll use a Sharpie? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it needs to be hand-delivered and uh, signed by um, – oh, shoot. What's the the lady's name? Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Me, no, not me. Mila. Uh, Mila. Mila Kunis? You talking about yeah. Mila Kunis? Mila Kunis. It needs to be signed by her. And uh, <laughs> Who's that really hot like Hawaiian girl who's – on those she's, uh, yeah not she's Hawaiian. Hawaiian yeah friends with benefits right <laughs> right <laughs> that's what she's most popular for probably not it <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say no if she is my friends with benefits okay let's with that we'll the show so yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> guys i want to say thank you so much for for joining tonight uh always a pleasure i'm going to give you one more opportunity to kind of go around the table tell everybody where you blog at and how they can find you and all those good things so uh blake off to you first thanks again enjoyed it blake from bourboner.com uh instagram twitter facebook it's b-o-u-r-b-o-n-r what <laughs> say that again <laughs> I think I was scolding my children when uh, Carrie was going earlier, so I missed half of his introductions. <laughs> I only referenced it once. So okay. I allowed one time. You hit your limit early. He hit you. I'll go ahead. I'm, I'm Nick, one of the three guys behind BreakingBourbon.com. Find us uh, online or on uh, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at Breaking Bourbon. Thanks again, guys. Great show. Thank you, buddy. All right, Carrie, you're up. 
from suburbia s w w w dot s u b o u r b i a dot com or on twitter at bourbon underscore gamer also suburbia and um thanks again guys lots of fun i'm kind of tired though i think that two hours of tennis wore me down a little bit <laughs> or it was my late start one or the other Playing that four five league, you're in you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got him chasing around the court. <laughs> yeah, and this is uh Brian from Sippin' Corn, S I P P N Corn. Uh find me on Twitter at, at Sippin' Corn and uh Sippin' Corn And uh thanks guys, really enjoy it. Absolutely. And again, appreciate you guys coming on. Uh for anybody that we had mentioned at the very beginning, we are gonna be switching to video. We're actually gonna take this and probably uh hack it up a little bit and post it on to, uh, to Facebook as well. So give the guys uh, credit where credit's due. And uh, again, thank you for jumping in and uh, you know, sharing all your insights about what's been happening in the, I guess you can say the, the lull of bourbon news lately, because it has been a few weeks since we jumped on. We didn't have too much to talk about, but it, it was, it was definitely good. And I'm sure here. Yeah, great questions time, in chat. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to keep this going for sure. This is definitely one of the most, uh, heavily listened to podcasts and and with good reason just because of uh, the great content and what we get going on because for some reason people love it when you bitch about bourbon i don't know why but <laughs> always <laughs> fun because they agree <laughs> they <should. laughs> so make sure you us uh, make sure you subscribe to us on itunes write good itunes reviews all that good thing follow these guys on social media follow us as well instagram facebook and twitter at bourbon pursuit and with that we will see you all next week Night, fellas. Good night. Good night.